Well, hello and welcome to the speaker that uh, for the Montana Friends of the Montana Historical Society speaker today. Uh, before I introduce Nancy Thornton, I want to just say a few things about newspapers in our collection uh, at the Society. I know a lot of you have spent time in the Research Center collating newspapers, which is a thankless task. Um, pages all have to be in order. Things have to be flat. The date has to be right. Newspapers mess up sometimes. Uh, get the dates, get the sections in the correct order, get the inserts, make sure everything is there so that they can be microfilmed. And microfilm is the, the vehicle for keeping newspapers for hundreds of years. It's very expensive to do, so we want to do it right the first time, and you've all helped, uh, many of you have helped do that. Once those exist, people can look at them, and you have a reader, and you get kind of seasick, and you're looking, and you're looking, and you're looking. Well, luckily, they started a project for digitizing newspapers. So the Library of Congress, with Chronicling America and the Montana Newspapers Association, I believe, for Montana newspapers, uh, has helped fund doing some of this digitization. We have a digital projects librarian, Natasha Hollenbach, who has, I mean, thousands have arranged with a committee to, to find the, the most topical, the most regionally appropriate papers um, to sample for this, because you can't do all of every one, but we have thousands of pages of newspapers digitized because of Natasha and her work. Um, she's in the back row today to listen. <laughs> Last week she got the Governor's Award for Excellence uh, for state employee uh, work, so <laughs> we're very proud of her and proud of her work. And using that work, leads to our speaker, Nancy Thornton, who comes to us today from Shoto. Shoto Acantha reporter Nancy C. Thornton spent 19 years writing about the current events and people making news east of the Continental Divide along the Rocky Mountain front. Now semi-retired, she continues to weave narratives based on her love of history, using her skills based on two decades of experience in archival, historical, and genealogical research. Nancy and her husband, Ralph, live near Shoto, where they explore the surrounding mountains, forests, and plains every chance they get. Here's Nancy. How many of you have been to Shoto? Ah. For the July 4th festival or just passing through? Passing through. Okay. July 4th? No one, oh boy, you've got to be there. It's the festival, it's the big festival that we have. Um, it is nice to be here with people who share the passion that I have for local history. Um, now, through all these years, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, I have uh, finally funneled my passion into books, which, and I'm going to do several readings today while I explain how it all came about. So my husband Ralph, the white-haired guy in the back, and I have, uh, we moved to Shoto in about nine miles north of Shoto in uh, 1999. And he was retired, but I didn't want to be retired. Didn't know if I could take it. Um, and I um, got a job at the newspaper in town, the show to Acantha. Now, that, had, that job survived 19 years, and I just retired June 15th. So I'm semi-retired, though, which I'll explain in a few minutes. But you know how they say, you know you're not 
in Kansas anymore? <laughs> well, one of the first stories that I ever wrote for the Acantha was about a, how a couple who were a ranching family was coping because he had been kicked in the jaw by a cow and it, his jaw was wired shut. Now, you take a girl from Illinois and put her into that kind of realm and you know you're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> um, now, the Acantha, as, as you may know from having perused a lot of the newspapers, has been around since 1894. The, it started out in De Poyer, and uh, Acantha stands for a prickly plant, and they, the editor owner wanted to be a thorn in the side of the politicians. So it kind of works. He also wanted De Poyer to be the county seat and I think Anaconda to be the capital. But um, that didn't happen. Teton County was created in 1893, and the Shoto became the permanent county seat a year later. And 10 years later, in 1904, the printing press and the uh, employees, whoever was working there, moved the whole shebang and the subscription list to Shoto, where there was already a newspaper, the Montanian, and so there was competition, which is rare in weekly newspapers these days. Um, but since that time, those Shoto newspapers have been just a wealth of unique stories. It's so because of my love of history and because I had a very liberal editor, I was able to put in historical, I call them vignettes once in a while as I covered the school board meetings and the city council and the county meetings and did personal profiles. So I'd like to read the first story. It's called The Curious Case of the Death of Dr. Wine. Dr. Walter B. Wine was a gentleman in every sense of the word. So a report that he had been murdered shocked officials and the citizens living in Dupuyer and Shoto. The good doctor had died, yes, but a coroner's inquest in January 1903 had determined that the 36-year-old man died of heart failure suddenly, quietly, and alone in his second-story apartment in the Titus building next to McGee's drugstore in Dupuyer. He had many friends in the community, friends who loved him for his many sterling qualities, according to the local newspaper. His body had been properly buried, but then a Great Falls undertaker had exhumed, embalmed, and shipped the remains to Virginia two weeks later at Walter's mother's request for burial in the Middle River Church of the Brethren Cemetery in New Hope, Virginia. Now, Susan Wine was demanding an investigation after a Virginia undertaker noticed signs of violence on Walter's body. How could the coroner's jury in Teton County, six well-known and highly respected Dupuy residents, have missed that? How could Coroner Stearns have missed that? Born in Virginia, the ninth of 11 children, Dr. Wine had moved to Dupuy in June 1901 after spending two years as a gold miner in the treadmill mines on Douglas Island, Alaska. Before that, he had doctored the citizens of several Montana towns, including Twin Bridges. Wine was a graduate of the University of Colorado and the University of Maryland. He arrived in Dupuyer, a community that had, already a, that had already a doctor, and set up shop 
in the Titus building. He advertised his profession as physician and surgeon with special attention to confinement and surgical cases. Calls promptly answered day or night, his ad read. Wine had arrived in Dupuyer a month after the town had lost that resident doctor. Dr. William Titus, 41, who died from nervous exhaustion following pneumonia in May 1901. Now the town was again in mourning. Wine was last seen at about 10 o'clock on a Monday night when he was around town in his usual health. He must have then retired to his rooms and gone to bed, the Montanian newspaper reported. The narrative full of details began. Lloyd Leach and family occupied the ground floor of the building in which were the doctor's rooms as a residence, and Mrs. Leach noticed on Tuesday that she did not hear the doctor coming downstairs or making any noise. She did not think this peculiar at first, as she thought he might have been called into the country as often was the case. On Wednesday, when he did not show up and callers found his door locked, Suspicion was aroused, and it was resolved to investigate the matter. A ladder was secured and placed at his office window, which was open. Deputy Sheriff Weimer went up and found the body lying on the office floor, dressed in his underclothes. The door was then forced open, and coroner, coroner Stearns took possession. From the appearance of the room, one would judge that the doctor had been reading in bed, and had thrown back the covers, placed his book upon them, and taking the lamp, walked into the office adjoining. He then placed the lamp on the desk and sank to the floor dead. He was found lying on his side and one leg drawn up. But there was no evidence of a struggle. He had frequently spoken of being troubled with heart disease, and this probably ended his life, the newspaper said. A coroner's jury was summoned, and from the evidence at hand, the men brought in a verdict of death from natural causes, Dr. Stern suggesting the heart disease. Strange, then, that a coroner's jury in Staunton, Virginia, returned a verdict on January 22, 1903, that Dr. Wine was murdered. Physicians testified that Wine's skull had been fractured in four places and that the brain had been deeply pierced by a sharp instrument. A cut over his eye was sewed up and covered with plaster. The mystery remained for a week, and the matter put to rest with two paragraphs in the Montanian's front page under the heading, Corpse Was in a Wreck. <laughs> it said... The officials of the Great Northern Express Company have made public the following, signed by D.S. Eliot, general manager of the company. Notify parties interested that remains of Walter B. Wine were in a wreck on our line and had more or less crushed, while accounts, which accounts for the relatives in Virginia supposing Dr. Wine to have been murdered instead of dying of heart failure. With that settled, Teton County officials embarked on settling Dr. Wine's estate. His belongings included medical and school books, two satchels of medicines and surgical instruments, a trunk, a horse, a lounge, a broken stove, clothing, an amputating horse, and $440 in the bank. Administrator William Franklin paid all expenses and shipped what could not be sold with a draft of the balance of $125 to Walter's mother. <laughs> so I wrote that one in 2012. And uh, as, I as I said, I became enamored in what I call antique journalism at that point. I just love exploring the old newspapers for stories. And I did some... Uh, some research. But at first I used the library, uh, the newspapers that were in the Shoto Library. And um, sometimes 
I had to drive to Helena for the microfilm. Sometimes I used the Great Falls Tribune microfilm, which many of you may uh, have had an opportunity to see. The, um, but it was, it was this microfilm. Then in, um, 2006, I got really interested in uh, volunteering to the point that I helped put the Teton County Courthouse on the register, National Register. So more and more, uh, as, as the years and months went by, I relied on those newspapers that were available to me. I also have a Teton County genealogy website that is attached to my um, book website, which I'll mention in a few minutes. Now, the big push to do even more with the old news that I was able to find came in 2013 when Shoto became, uh, when Shoto was going to celebrate its 100-year uh, incorporation. Now, Shoto's been around since the 1880s, and as a matter of fact, three miles north of Shoto, there uh, was a Blackfeet agency. It was the second Blackfeet agency. The first one was in Fort Benton. And the, um, that was built in 1816, uh, it was completed in 1869. So that corridor, uh, on US 89 has been used, you know, as long as there's been settlement in this country. And I turned to and got permission to do an old news column of about 600 to 700 words in preparation for our, the celebration of the centennial uh, of um, Shoto's incorporation. And then I was able to find more and more of these gems. And now I'd like to read a story that I wrote in 2014. It's called Sheriff's Tale. Former Acantha publisher Jerry Coffey and his editor Ted Neville placed this tale abridged a bit here for space reasons, on the November 7, 1957 edition's front page below the fold. It can never be said that a sheriff's job is a dull one. Teton County Sheriff Tom Delwo has a story to tell which equals anything TV has to offer. About 10 days ago, Delwo had gone to Glasgow to pick up a prisoner being held there. He and the prisoner had come as far as three miles north of Dutton when Delwo saw a car from Al with Alberta tags parked along the highway headed north. As their car approached the parked car, Delwo noticed that a man and woman were standing beside it. And as he watched, the man slapped the woman a car prevented him from seeing more as his car passed the parked vehicle. After they passed, however, his prisoner looked back and told Delwo, you better stop and get back there or he's going to kill her. Delwo then stopped, turned around, and headed back. By the time he reached the spot, the woman was lying on her back on the shoulder of the road and her companion was astride her, beating on her. By this time, she was unconscious, Delwell said. When Delwo approached and made known his identity to the man, he surrendered, and Delwo really had a predicament on his hands. I had three prisoners and two cars to get to Shoto, he said. The original prisoner seemed a trustworthy person, however, the sheriff said. So he entrusted with the Alberta, he was entrusted with the Alberta car and he and the beaten woman drove on to Shoto ahead of the sheriff and his new prisoner. <laughs> Delwo called ahead to the deputy and notified him of his additions and asked to have Judge Irwin, 
meet them at the sheriff's office. Upon their arrival in Shoto, the original prisoner was placed in confinement. The woman had, by this time, regained consciousness and swore out a warrant against her companion for assault and battery, for which Judge Irwin found the man guilty, and he was fined $50. After a short discussion, he paid this assessment and went outside to his car. The woman told him she was absolutely finished with him and began inquiring about wiring to her home for funds to return with. The sheriff assured her that his office could take care of this problem. Then Delwell reminded the woman that she had a good deal of clothing in the car. He offered to accompany her while she obtained this clothing, and they went to the car for this purpose. After she had opened the trunk and started to remove the clothes, her former companion began to talk to her, Delwell said. And by the time he finished talking, she was once again beside him in the front seat of the car, and they were Canada-bound. <laughs> so ta getting to what the, I wanted to really explain to you and the work regarding the work Natasha has done, and Jennifer Burnell, I'd like to give her credit, too. Starting about 2012, um, our Shoto librarian, our former librarian, Marsha Hinch, she was able to raise about $13,000 to eventually put, sh uh, to digitize the Shoto newspapers. She bought microfilm rolls from the Historical Society and from a place called ProQuest, which had some that uh, the Historical Society didn't have. And she worked with a company called Advantage uh, to digitize those rolls. And at about 2012, the newspapers were being uh, uploaded to, and Jennifer was doing this for us in our library, to the Montana Historical Society under the Montana Memory Project website. Um, and at that point, the newspapers became fully word searchable. Now that part of it took about three years, and I am so gratified that there's free access to those newspapers. Now the second site that Becca referred to, the Chronicling America, dot LOC, which stands for Library of Congress, dot gov. That start, I believe that started about 2008. And that has, you know, newspapers from all over the country, um, including Montana newspapers. And they had the, like, the River Press in Fort Benton, which was along with the Helena papers, were some of the earliest papers there were here in this end of Montana. And I was able to use, to search under Chronicling America for a lot of my early, early stories. Because Shoto did not have a newspaper until um, like 1888 or so, 1887, 1888. And it only lasted a few years. And then in 1890, the Montanian started, and that lasted, that lasted a good 20 years. And then, as I said, the Acantha picked up the slack and became our newspaper, which it has been ever since. Another very valuable site uh, that I use is the Montana prison records you have online, because I do a lot of crime stories. And they, it's just amazing to read those convict records. I believe the, the newspapers morphed from Montana Memory to montananewspapers.org in about 2015, although you may, know, uh, you may be able to correct that date a little bit. That's what I understand. So what have I been able to do that I am most proud of? because of the work that your and our historical society has done. 
have, how many have heard of Man Gulch? Everybody. Yes. As you're aware, that was 13 firefighters who died in 1949, made famous by the young man in fire. Well, we're, has anyone heard of Waldron Creek? My husband has, of course, but <laughs> not a single one. In night, August of 1931, on the slopes of Waldron Creek, five firefighters died. Where is that story? It was nowhere. It wasn't even in the Forest Service records. But it was in the newspapers. So I wrote that story in 2003. And Charles Palmer, who is a, a, a resident of Bozeman, I think he works at the university. Well, I don't know which university. I never get them straight. But uh, he worked, he used my, uh, the basics of my story and has written a, a whole book about the Waldron Creek Fire. I can't quite remember the name, sorry. Um, oh, the um, Waldron Creek is about, is a, uh, a uh, creek in the uh, Lewis and Clark National Forest about 25 miles west of Shoto. You go up, have you heard of the Teton ski area? Yeah, it's on the way to the ski area, ski area, which isn't open anymore, sorry to say. Um, and there's no sign, not yet anyway. Maybe we'll get one one day about our people. The coroner had the audacity to say that uh, when they, you know, they had an inquest for these gentlemen, and uh, he wrote on there, no one to blame but themselves. <laughs> yeah, that's what he wrote. Now you know that that doesn't sound right today. There's always some cascade of failures that go to a, you know, a disaster. It's the other thing I'm very proud of is that, you know, knock on wood, there's been one deputy sheriff killed on, in the line of duty in Shoto. And I was able to resurrect that story. That happened in 1935. And there's been one fireman, volunteer fireman, who's died in the line of duty. And that happened in 1926. And so I have memorialized those stories. And I'm very proud of that. But on a lighter note, I'd like to read another story. Uh, let's see this book. It's called Ralph Pulitzer Goes to Court. And the basis for this story were multiple sources, um, which you will soon see. The Butte Inter Intermountain Daily Newspaper devoted a page and a half spread on Montana's first game warden, W.F. Scott, on January 1, 1903, in which Scott was profiled as having stopped the slaughter of Montana's big game by rigidly enforcing game laws through su successful prosecutions. So it was that when Deputy Game Warden J.H. Hall learned that the privileged son Ralph of multimillionaire publisher Joseph Pulitzer of New York had killed a mountain sheep out of season in northern Teton County, on June 15th, Scott made an all-out effort to arrest the young man and prosecute him to the fullest ex extent of the law. In those days, Teton County extended to the Canadian border, and Shoto was the county seat where Hall, who was based in Great Falls, convinced Teton County Justice of the Peace, J.E. DeHaz, on August 19th, 1903, to sign a complaint for Pulitzer's arrest. 
The news hit the wire services that very day, and reports about the incident appeared in dailies nationwide. The Fergus County Argus reported, Pulitzer reached Montana six weeks ago, and in company with Mr. J.W. Schultz, a well-known tourist guide, spent three weeks camping in the mountains near St. Mary Lake. Later, he went to Fort Benton, where he built a houseboat and floated down the Missouri, hunting by the way, until he reached Glasgow, where he took the train with his party for New York. In the accounts that followed, Pulitzer was accused variously of killing one or three mountain sheep out of season and either leaving the heads or the carcasses at the camp where Hall found them. Pulitzer had celebrated his 24th birthday the week before the incident. The local weekly newspapers, the Depuy Acantha and the Shoto Montanian, were also on the story, publishing accounts on August 20th and 21st, respectively. The following week, the news reports told of how Scott cagely arrested Pulitzer as he came out of Yellowstone National Park. Game Warden Scott lay in hiding at Monida, just across the Idaho line, and almost before the New Yorker had proceeded half a dozen feet into Montana, the officer pounced upon him and made him his prisoner, stated the Minneapolis Journal. Bulitzer was arraigned before Justice de Haas and waived his preliminary examination. The judge bound him over to the district court and fixed his bail at $1,000, which was furnished by local bankers Hirschberg Brothers. The story was news fodder for months, as Pulitzer's attorneys secured several continuances before District Judge D.F. Smith in Shoto. State Attorney General James Donovan was the lead prosecutor, but he inexplicably continued the case in June 1904 without any legal reason, Judge Smith was quoted as saying in the Shoto Acantha. Note that the Acantha Press had moved from Depoyer in Shoto in March of 1904. Then Scott arrested Pulitzer for killing an antelope out of season in Fergus County on that June boat trip a year before. I had no idea I was violating the laws of Montana. I have always tried to be a law-abiding citizen. While ignorance of the law does not excuse anyone I am of the opinion that this case against me has been pushed a trifle hard. I have, however, no complaint to make against anyone. I am prepared to defend, defend myself and will rest my case with my attorneys, Pulitzer told the Argus. But upon the advice of his lawyers, Pulitzer pleaded guilty in August 1904 of killing that antelope, then finally pleaded guilty on November 28th in, to killing one mountain sheep. He paid $500 in fines in each case, which in today's dollars equals about 13500 <laughs> Now, in writing the old news columns, each week in the Acantha, which I still do, that's why I'm kind of semi-retired, you could say. I have readers who have told me, that's the first thing I read <laughs> when I get my paper, <laughs> which, of course, is nice to hear. But what do you do with an old newspaper? It's good for coffee grounds, right? And I decided that um, what I should do is to put those little stories in book form. But do you know how hard it is to write a book? I mean, you've got to prepare a manuscript, and you've got to edit it, and then you bring it to a publisher who can take it or leave it, and then they have their own editing, and. Gosh, it takes forever. So I didn't want to go that route. But a good search on the internet showed 
me that self-publishing was the way to go. I use a company called Lulu.com, and I use my husband because he knows how to use the program in design, which can format the manuscript. And it, you can, for no money, you upload it into the Lulu system. And then you begin buying books, or you sell them on Lulu. I sell them on Amazon, and I'm going to sell if anyone wants to buy some books today, I have them for sale here for $15 each. So the first book, Tales from Montana's Rocky Mountain Front, is Tales from the 1870s to about 1935. And the second book, which for good or ill looks like the first book, <laughs> but they're a series. So this book is from 30s, 40s, and the war years. And with that, I'd like to read uh, a couple more stories because back, one thing I discovered is just about ev everything except pregnancy, basically, I would say, was in the newspapers. You knew when someone went to Warm Springs. You knew every detail of when they were in the hospital. You, you know, but talking about pregnant women was taboo. That they didn't do. So, um, which I think it's called in confinement. Okay, you all know about that. Um, let's see, let's find this book, this story here. Blizzard Kills Children. That the winds around here can kill with a terrible less, was a terrible lesson learned, although at first the Acantha reported that everyone was safe in the aftermath of the December 6, 1932 blizzard. Following a period of mostly beautiful weather, it began to snow Sunday night, December 4th, and by the morning... About five inches had fallen. The storm continued on Monday, making about seven inches of snow, after which the temperature dropped to 17 degrees. About 8.30 Tuesday morning, December 6th, a straight north wind sprang up in an instant and sent the snow swirling into the air. Visibility was almost completely annihilated the December 8th, Acantha reported. Many children en route to school were engulfed in the storm. Some were unable to reach their destination, and others made their way there with great difficulty that Tuesday. There were narrow escapes reported in that first newspaper after the storm. A week later, the December 15th, Acantha gave the details of what had gone unreported until a man traveled 18 miles to town on foot over snow-blocked roads after the Acantha had gone to press. Despite fervent hopes that there would be no fatalities as a result of la last week's frightful blizzard, two were learned of here last Thursday night when Charles Twiggs brought word to town that Irene Linjati, 15, and Sylvia Linjati, 8, were frozen to death near the Hotchkiss School in District Number 62, about 18 miles southwest of Shoto. The story began. The two sisters, daughters of Victor and Ida Linjati, had started to school a mile away just before the storm broke at 8.30 Tuesday morning. They were alone as their two brothers had preceded them several minutes and had taken a different route to the schoolhouse. Both Ted Arnsmeyer, the teacher, and his younger brother Martin went out into the, the storm at the risk of their own lives to look for them when they did not arrive. But as visibility was almost totally obliterated, they found no trace of them and were forced to return. That afternoon, Mr. Linjati arrived at the school to take his children home 
only to learn that the girls were not there. A search party of men familiar with the country was organized, and twigs came upon the bodies lying beside a barbed wire fence about a half mile from the schoolhouse. There were, they were within 10 feet of each other, and the youngest girl had fallen forward with her face down in the snow. A cut on the face of one of the girls seemed to indicate that they had run into the wire in the blinding storm. Both were heavily clad for the winter walk, but had the mitten on their right hand off. The lids were off their lunch pails, and the contents showed that they had endeavored to revive themselves by eating. Milk in the bottles had been drunk. The bodies were removed to the school, but the girls did not revive. On Friday, they were brought to Shoto by horse and sleigh, Ten schoolboys acted as pallbearers when the girls were laid to rest in one grave in the Shoto Cemetery. Now, so just to reiterate, with the help of people like you at the Historical Society and their online programs, I have been able to continue my research and to write these stories and I hope to have more books coming because I've got to write one story a week, and that's 52 <laughs> stories, which <laughs> is a lot of words built up. So I'd like to read one more story, and I'd like to add a postscript before we have questions. How many of you have uh, heard of the Baker Massacre? Good, a lot of you. Okay, well, we'll talk about that in a minute because it has a connection to this story. Two, two. Here we go. This last one is called Roman Coin. Nine-year-old Mac Bruno Jr. made a curious find when he picked up an odd-looking object near the base of Ear Mountain that resembled a pebble but upon subsequent examination proved to be an old Roman coin. Ear Mountain is the mountain we see from our picture window when we're in Shoto, along the Rocky Mountain front. The Acantha did not write about it until a year later in the February 20th, 1941 edition. Bruno, the son of Mac Sr. and Marie Bruno, lived with his parents near the mountains 24 miles west of Shoto. The boy showed the pebble about an inch and one-eighth in diameter and an eighth of an inch thick and coated with dirt and gravel to his father, who, believing it was a coin, sent it to the U.S. Mint, which turned it over to the Smithsonian Institution at Washington for examination, the account explained. The institution turned the pebble over to an expert who declared it was a coin, all right, a coin struck during the reign of the Roman Emperor Hadrian between 117 and 138 A.D. On the obverse side, in bas relief, the head of Hadrian easily can be discerned, while the reverse bears the figure of a woman in the letter S. Although the coin has been identified an explanation of how it came to be at the foot of a mountain years after it was cast still is lacking, the Acantha said. Bruno said he found the coin in a teepee ring, a ring of stones used to weigh down the edges of the conical shelter of the Plains Indian lore. The Acantha noted that the area where the coin was found was along what is known as the Great North Trail or the Old North Trail, over which thousands of travelers moved north from the warmer southern regions to the Arctic Circle centuries before the Blackfeet Indians came. The Acantha stated, and I don't know how true this is, the Acantha stated that the Blackfeet and other northern plains tribes said they did not make the rings and that they were left by some earlier race. One explanation offered 
was that Spaniards brought the coin from Europe early in American history, and it came via trappers or explorers and found its way into the hands of someone traversing that Old North Trail. Another suggestion was that it may have been lost by a collector, but the spot where it was found, the Acantha said, is little visited even by hunters and fishermen, and the coin apparently had laid for many years, perhaps for centuries, before the boy picked it up. The Acantha in the early days often mentioned people who went on outings to look for arrowheads. One can imagine the boy's excitement that the coin might be worth something, as he also wondered how the coin got lost near his home. His enthusiasm was dashed by the candid reply that was not centered on why a coin was found, but on its value and its lack of provenance, a term to denote that the boy had retrieved it from its place in the ground unlike what an archaeologist would have done. The article stated, in recent correspondence with the Smithsonian Institution concerning the coin, Ranger L.J. Howard received additional information from T.D. Beloit, curator of history who identified the coin. Mr. Beloit says the coin in question is a genuine Roman coin of the period mentioned. It is, however, in a very poor state of preservation and for that reason is worth not more than one or two dollars in the coin market today. Coins of this inferior character are not regarded highly by collectors of ancient coins and are, as a matter of fact, rarely offered for sale because there is no demand for them. Insofar as the location in which the coin was found is concerned, coins of this type have been occasionally mentioned as having been found in the region just east of the Rocky Mountains, but in most cases the exact locations of such finds are not well authenticated. I regard it as possible, but unlikely that the Spaniards at an early period may have presented such coins to Indians in token of friendship, and that these coins may have been transported by the Indians to places in which such coins were later found. The letter S on the coin in question has no reference to the value of the coin. It is part of, of the abbreviation SC or Centatus Consultum, indicating that the issue of bronze coins during the period to which this coin belongs was the prerogative of the Roman Senate." Unquote. The Roman coin continues to be mentioned in various publications about the Old North Trail. Perhaps another one will be discovered one day when another curious child goes looking. So the postscript on that, which I was just, just sparkled. I, I was sparkled with enthusiasm. Uh, my husband and I went to the commemoration, which they have each year, of the Baker Massacre, or the Massacre on the Marias, or the Marias Massacre, or the Bear River Massacre. It has many, many names, but it's in Browning each year around the anniversary of the January 23rd, 1870 massacre of about 173 Blackfeet Indians, mostly women and children, on the Marias River up there by, of course, the U.S. Army. Um, so we listened to some of the workshops uh, and uh, later in talking to one of the tribal members. Darned if he didn't mention the coin. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. There was you know, one reference in the Acantha, as I said, and that was it. The, but that story is a legend on the Blackfeet Reservation to this day. So that's what I have for you today. Any questions? Ah, 